We are now recording. Thank you very much for attending and or viewing in the, in the future episode five of Worldwide Slot Car Chat. Uh, today we have a couple regulars and a couple new attendees slash guests and we'll start off as I usually do with a short introduction. Anybody who's been on a past call, just give us a short introduction. Uh, and if you've never been on a call before and you want to share your uh, slot car hobby history, then I'll welcome you to do that. So I'll start. My name is Greg Galb, otherwise known as Mr. Flippant on the various forums. I've been racing uh, 132nd scale primarily, hard body, uh, slot car analog and digital for about 10 years now. Uh, but I'll race anything. If you if you, if you got a track, I'll come over and race with you. Uh, Kelly, do you want to go ahead? Um, yeah, I'm Kelly Avery, um, known on the forums as Genie2369. Um, I'm strictly digital. Um, um, my background is SCX digital. I'm in the process of switching over to Scalectric digital. Um, and just like Greg, I, I'll, I'll race on analog. I'll race anything um, if, if I'm invited. And that's pretty much my story. <laughs> Excellent. Jeff, you've been here before. Go ahead and give your quick intro. Yeah, certainly. Everyone can hear me, right? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, Jeff Nagel coming out of Indianapolis, Indiana. This is supposed to be the month of May, but it's very depressing right now. Um, primarily, I'm into digital. I haven't been doing this for very long at all. Uh, Greg was one of my first contacts in uh, learning more about this whole thing. And it's quite exciting. Uh, just the knowledge base that I've gotten to know a lot of people. Um, you guys know a ton of stuff, a lot of things. And it's great to at least tap into that and get some knowledge very, very quickly. This is like the college education you never got for slot cars. Just listening to you guys talk. It's very, very fascinating. Um, just have all a bunch of Skelectrics. Um, haven't raced anything else. So I'm just carving my way out. In fact, just the other day, I got this, this fine thing in the mail. So I'm happy about that. Seems to be the preferred choice of power base. But I'll race anything just like the other guy said. Um, bring it on, let's check it out. I'm very interested. All right, thank you very much. And we pretty much all started where you are at some point in the past. So, you know, we all knew nothing and learned from the pros. Uh, Ron, would you like to go ahead with the introduction? Sure. Um, hi, my name's Ron Neubauer. Um, I go by the tag either Rolo 9th or Rolo 9th SS on a lot of the forums. Um, I've listened to the uh, last two um, sessions that you've had on YouTube. So, um, I find a lot of similarities with a lot of introductions there. Um, my slot car story started in the 70s. I guess it was about 1975 or so. Um, I got my first AFX set uh, for Christmas that year. Um, I had begged my parents for one because I saw Jackie Stewart advertising the closest thing to real racing uh, on television a lot. So uh, I was quite into it and uh, got a set and was really into HO cars for a number of years there. Um, probably acquired about 40 or 50 cars. My dad was pretty proactive about, um, getting me a car for a good report card or a good, you know, grade at school. So I, I built up my, my collection. Uh, and then I hit, you know, about 12 or 13 or so and, and girls suddenly weren't the enemy anymore. So, uh, you know, cars got packed away and really didn't think too much of them till, uh, till I got to be about driving age or so. And, you know, my friends and I got into real cars and, uh, uh, we we're mostly into Chrysler products. And, uh, I remembered my AFX cars and my one, uh, 72 Plymouth Roadrunner, uh, was always my best car. So I dug my cars, <clears throat> excuse me, out of the attic and kind of looked at them and checked them out all. And, uh, yeah, put them back again. And like I said, didn't think too much of it. Um, Life moved on, got married, and uh, I grew up in New Jersey, and central New Jersey. And uh, one day, my uh, uh, wife and I we were in the town of, I think it's Garfield, and there's a small little shop there. And I saw this sign that said Aurora Road Racing in the window. And the sign was for a store named New Jersey Nostalgia. So I went in there, and it was a store that was devoted 
95% slot car stuff run by a guy by the name of Joe Correa. Some of you may know him if you're into HO slots or not. And for me, it was just like the fire was totally reignited. I was like, wow, I didn't think anything like this existed. So I got really hot and heavy into HO for a number of years. Uh, built a four lane track in my basement of my house and, you know, was, was having a lot of fun with that, but couldn't really find anybody. It was kind of pre-internet days. So there really wasn't a lot of uh, ability to find folks where I lived that, that were into it. Um, fast forward a while, um, I guess it was around 2007 or so. Um, my son and I went to a train show um, in New Jersey and uh, there was a lot of, um, clubs that had layouts there uh, and we went towards the back of the room and I saw um, a racetrack there and a bunch of kids were around it. I was like, oh, that's kind of neat. Um, I had known about 132nd, uh, but I wasn't really into it. You know, uh, I appreciated the fly cars. I thought they looked amazing. But for me, you know, HO was where it was at because you could fit so much more track into a given area. And uh, Anyhow, I saw this this layout and, you know, it was two lanes wide, but like five or six cars were circling around it. And then I saw one of the cars, you know, switch lanes. And I was like, what the heck is this? So I talked with the guy and he said, oh, this is SCX digital. It's new. It's, you know, you have a fuel gauge. And, uh, well, I was blown away. And I, I couldn't believe that slot cars had advanced to this level. So uh, I went home and I kind of ruminated on it for a while and decided this is the direction I need to go in. So I sold all my HO stuff, got very heavily into SCX Digital. Um, but as we all know, SCX kind of faded out of the picture after a while. And my life situation changed, uh, went through divorce, went through job loss. And I wound up selling all my uh, SCX stuff just because bills needed to be paid. Uh, I wound up relocating to just north of Atlanta, Georgia, about 10 years ago. Um, I bought some SCX stuff that I found off uh, Craigslist and started getting into it again. And um, But I really didn't have a space. Uh, we were living in a townhouse, didn't have space really set up a track. So I became an acquirer of things. I just kept you know, buying stuff, looking forward to the inevitable day where I could build my track. Um, but you know, uh, as SCX really wasn't being supported anymore, I started t casting my gaze towards, well, Carrera or Scalextric, which which do I want to go with? And I eventually decided on Scalextric just because uh, I like the narrower footprint and it was a little more prevalent in terms of availability of where I'm at. Um, I started with the uh, the power base, the was a 7042, I think it is, power base and uh, one of the race management systems, but uh, just playing around with it on my table. I could never really get it to work right. Uh, then the Arc Pro system came out a couple of years ago, and that's where I've sunk most of my money and efforts into, uh, you know, from there, that point on. Um, I've been mostly collecting cars at this point. Um, I have about just over 900 now of uh, various makes yeah um, really big into that 1965 to maybe 1995 era uh, sports car formula one and trans am are really my areas of interest uh, and a little over a year and a half ago uh, we moved into a, a new house and i have this huge basement downstairs and greg you may know me i'm building the zuffenheim track um, I'm that guy. So I uh, have been working in my basement, been uh, finishing it off, um, got carpeting laid down now finally, and all my tables are built. Um, and I have a eight foot by 36 foot blight canvas to work with that I'm uh, very eager to get going on. So that's kind of my story. Nice. Yeah, I'm super jealous of that uh, basement. That's a uh... Man cave heaven, and and were you the one that was saying you're going to do a wet bar over on one side too? Or yeah, yeah, I have a, a, another side on the bar, so that'll be um, yeah, I'll have a bar over there and kind of like a what I'm calling my race cafe. I uh, I have a nostalgia for you know things from like the '60s and '70s racing signs and just stuff from that era. It just I didn't live through it, but it has a magical charm for me. So uh, I've acquired a lot of stuff through the years. So that's where I want to kind of decorate and make that my area. That's going to look so great. I look forward to yeah. seeing 
pictures that you share of that. And I've cool. and you've been sharing a lot so far. So I'm yeah. counting on you to keep, keep All right, on man. sharing. Sounds good. And I just want to say I want to thank you because um, I've also gotten into 3D printing as well. And you're, I heard you talking with Kelly previously a few minutes ago about the uh, the border inserts and I've printed off a ton of those with my Ender 3D printer and uh, really like the 3D printing aspect and what that brings to the hobby. I've printed off tons of figures and structures and all kinds of things for my future track. So um, I want to say thank you for developing those flat curves because that's really, uh, really going to help the look and feel of my track. You're very welcome. <clears throat> thank you for sharing and sure. Uh, I'll go ahead and move to the next guy. And on my screen here, the next person is Mr. Martini. I'm not going to try your first name because I'm sure I'll destroy it. So I'll let you take it away. Okay. Ecuador <coughs> <coughs> Martini <coughs> in, in real life, Al Schwartz. Um, I uh, go back uh, 62 years in this hobby. I started in 1958 <clears throat> with a uh, visit to uh, Polk's uh, model craft on 34th Street and 5th Avenue in New York when I was a graduate student. <clears throat> Saw the first scale of template cars there. Now, two things that were coming together to lead me into it. Uh, earlier on in life, uh, I'd been an ardent HO model railroader. Uh, and then in the middle to late 50s, uh, I did uh, a little bit of the real one-to-one -one on track uh, competition. Uh, well, I had to have one of these. Uh, I'm a graduate student uh, stipend. It was hard to afford. But in New York City, if you look hard enough, you can find somebody who will get it for you wholesale, which happened. And a little figure eight of the original scale electric rubber track ended up on my... Uh, the floor of my apartment in Queens. Uh, and uh, there was the uh, genesis, if you will, of Ecuri Martini. Uh, my apartment mate, an old college roommate uh, at the time was a French speaking Belgian. Uh, and uh, we named the track uh, after our favorite Friday night tipple. Uh, things ended up, uh, you know, moved forward from there. Uh, to a uh, ripping up uh, the old HO gauge track in my parents' home, uh, putting down a four-lane scale electric track. Uh, and then we found out, or I found out, that the scale electric cars, the old template cars, were a bit fragile. I looked around for alternatives. Uh, first stab at that was uh, transplanting the guts of the car, the little sidewinder motor and the gimbal pickup, uh, into a botched together uh, 124th plastic car uh, made by Merritt and found at a place called Motor Books on 57th Street. Rolling on from there, uh, on and off for the next uh, 60 some odd years. Uh, some of this, by the way, if people want to look, uh, I do have a website. Uh, it's ecurymartini.com. No space between the two words. Uh, where am I now? Uh, because if I went through the whole, all of it uh, piece by piece, uh, you would all be uh, falling asleep with your eyes rolling back. Uh, after uh, my second divorce, yeah, I'm zero for two, I ended up in an apartment. So the track, large router track that I had is gone but I do have a second bedroom, which has been converted into a workshop. Uh, my focus now, because of local and worldwide interest, is on 132nd cars, and my interest is primarily in scratch-built cars. I have not bought a ready-to-run in several years, and I have enough motors, wheels, gears, bodies, and chassis around to far outlast any reasonable actuarial uh, uh, projection, open paren, I turned 84 on Sunday, close paren. Uh, so from, for me, from now on, it is really uh, the kind of projects underway at the moment are things like, uh, where did I put that down? Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, 
this is the first try at a, a Ferguson P99 that I built a few years ago. Uh, I am rebuilding it now uh, to a full four-wheel drive uh, uh, system. Uh, note in passing on my preferred method of working, uh, I know there's a lot of attention being paid to uh, 3D printing these days. Uh, I am still a little bit of a skeptic. Uh, this is a C-type Jaguar with a body from a chap in New Zealand. Uh, you need to hold it up a little bit for us. We can't see it. See it now? Hold it up. Oh, yeah. I couldn't see myself, so I didn't know where I was. Uh, uh, the chassis is a combination of scratch built and a uh, 3D printed uh, motor mount rear end. Uh, it went around the world on a proxy race, and you probably can't see it from here, but its last few races were uh, the performance was, uh, shall we say, uninspired. Uh, and when it returned, I found out why. The chassis is fractured in four places. <laughs> so, for me, it's still ironmongering. Uh, current projects, aside from the cars I'm working on, is bringing up a CNC controlled uh, mill. So I'll be able to continue to make the parts that I want without having to stand there and crank. Um, current projects on the board, coming back to that, uh, the uh, Ferguson four-wheel drive that I mentioned. Second one is an interesting one. It's a transatlantic collaboration with a chap by the name of Carver in Sweden on a Lotus 23. Uh, he's doing the body. And I'm doing the uh, the mechanical bits. Uh, at the moment, I have everything assembled except waiting for some uh, uh, a laser cut part, which is going to be the uh, rear engine mount. Um, the last thing, the last big item is a, uh, a pair of uh, entries to a uh, proxy race. It's a uh, 19 pair of 1939 Mercedes. Uh, the uh, 154 and um, 169, I think. The three liter and the one and a half liter ones. Uh, those are total scratch. Uh, I'm working on the bodies at the moment. Uh, when the blanks are done, they will be uh, molded in uh, silicone rubber and built up in uh, uh, resin. Uh, that's what keeps me busy at the moment. I'm retired, so I have a lot of time to put on and put in onto it. The only problem is that I rely a lot on jigs because, uh, and I figure I'm pretty lucky at this age. Uh, I have severe carpal tunnel syndrome in both hands. So I have practically no feeling, which makes working on small parts, uh, shall we say, challenging. <laughs> Over. There we go. Well, thank you very much for your uh, for sharing your history, and we look forward to seeing more of your work in the future. Uh, I'll go ahead and move on to Stan, Mr. Smith. Would you like to tell us a little bit of something about yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Stan Smith. Um... <laughs> We're playing mute tag here. Let me let me un. There you go. Okay, start over. You muted yourself again. <laughs> Unmute. There we go. Here I am. Okay. Stan Smith, um, stumbly on the forums, uh, and uh, an, an old acquaintance of Alan's. Uh, we met at one of several of the um, Las Vegas slot conventions some years ago. Uh, good to see you again, Alan. I started with slot racing um, in about 1962 with a Strombecker set, was a uh, D-Jag and Testarossa set, figure eight. And we set it up uh, on the rug as rug racers. And I had collected several, probably around 30 cars at that point and was an avid racer with friends until we Till I went off to college and then my mother decided that the comic books that I had and the slot cars that I had 
were no longer necessary for me since I was a college person and she gave them all away. So I was without slot cars until the mid 70s. Uh, and I stopped into a um, shop in Santa Monica, California called uh, Allied Model Trains. And they carried Fleischmann uh, slot cars. So I bought a Fleischmann set and um, a bunch of track. Had that all going uh, until I found a Skelextric set, which I didn't even think they were still in business because we in the United States at that point, and all the places I was, uh, there wasn't any slot race stuff available. So I bought this uh, Indianapolis Skelextric set, which had pretty crummy cars, but it was interesting. And they ran on the, on the uh, Fleischmann track, so it was okay. And then I bumped into a uh, store in San Pedro, California that carried die-cast cars. I walked in there and I saw a lot of really neat cars and they were all uh, die-cast except for this one section where they had these cars called Fly. And I thought, well, those look pretty neat and found out they were actually slot cars. And that began my next stage of slot racing um, until we moved to Maryland uh, for work and had a lot of interesting times in, in Maryland. I wound up working for a time at the Washington Post. Uh, then we came back to California. But during that time at the Washington Post, I was uh, introduced to a um, mail list called 132 slots and one of the participants on the 132 slots mailing list was a person by the name of Stephen Farr Jones who if you've been on slot forum you've seen uh, his revamp of his track the far out raceway and he got me interested in slot racing again this was around 1996 I came back from uh, Maryland saw that he had this beautiful track and about 3,000 cars and was uh, starting a club up called On the Hill Slot Racing. And we began racing then. And so I've been racing since uh, pretty much all the time since about 1996. Um, I built my own uh, routed track. Um, and it's now in my 60 by 40 shop that we have here in Oregon. Uh, also racing with a group of people here called NASTY, the Northwest Association of Slot Track Enthusiasts. Um, there's about four or five guys that have nice tracks. Uh, you've seen Mitch 58, you've seen uh, Reek 455, you've seen Kid Volt, all these guys are on the, on the forums. Uh, they're all members of that uh, club, and my track is about uh, 68 and a half feet uh, per lane. It's an 8 by 16 track, Autodromo Rosa Colin, because that's Italian for Red Hills Raceway. We live in the Red Hills uh, AVA on the wine country in Oregon. Um, and in fact, there's a wine, a vineyard in my backyard, not mine, but just over the fence and a winery just down the road about, oh, maybe a quarter of a mile. That's absolutely wonderful, excellent wine, Anderson. So it's been really, really great. Uh, slot racing and wine, who could ask for more? So that's about it. All right, well, thank you very much for that. I'm familiar with Monty and, and gang. I've gone down to his uh, racing and ribs or, or uh, slots and brats yearly uh, endurance racing on his digital track a couple of times. That's a whole lot of fun. I wish I lived closer, but I've got lots of guys around here to race with, so that's always nice. Uh, I'll go ahead and move on to Mr. Super Slab. Alan, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? I'll let you unmute yourself. There you That's go. A good start. That's a sound start. Uh, hi, I'm Alwyn, aka Super Slab. 
thanks for the welcome, Paul. I appreciate it. Uh, it's interesting, a lot of uh, known faces here. Um, Paul is, is just across, the, across downtown from me, and we see each other here, which is interesting. Uh, Chris Walker on the other side of the world. Dave Kennedy, Dave. Hi, David. And, uh, and Stan, yeah. So and there's a Tony. I'm still wondering which Tony that's going to be, but we'll, we'll no doubt see. Uh, I'm another one of these uh, thousand-year-old slot racers. Um, my wife has told me a million times I shouldn't exaggerate so much. And uh, I also raced slot cars. I got a scale electric track uh, set in South Africa in the late 60s, no, oh, middle 60s. Um, it progressed to, there was a local club that had a routed track, uh, used to take my bicycle and later on my 50cc motorcycle to get down to the track and uh, enjoyed it mightily and then life happened. And then uh, moved from South Africa in, uh, to Canada in what, 1980, no, 1997. Uh, and around 2008, I was uh, going through some boxes of stuff and found uh, my last remaining slot car from that era. And it started me wondering if this hobby still existed. So I went and looked up on the, on the internet and found a wonderful website called Old Slot Racer, which is... Uh, which piqued my interest and I looked, wow, this, this is neat stuff, but I didn't see a date anywhere on the website. So I thought my luck, this is probably something that's 20 years out of date, but I sent uh, an email and got a response from a gentleman by the name of Luff. He said, yeah, we're racing, come on around on Friday. We'll, uh, we'll show you around. And Luff of course is the, the absolute best ambassador that the slot world could ever have. He's, uh, he started showing me all the cars and all the wonderful tracks that he, that he had there. That was when he was still in his business at Archer. And, uh, and of course, he said, well, take a look at this one and take a look at this car. And I hadn't realized what slot cars looked like. And I was also a 60s uh, uh, era type of person used to follow endurance racing in South Africa. There was a Springbok series where most of the big names came over. Uh, and uh, with the 917s and the GT40s and the T70 Mark III's, etc. So seeing these cars, and especially seeing cars like Fly made a bunch of the Gunston cars that I saw racing in real life about 700 years ago, and uh, I was absolutely hooked. And uh, I was about to feel embarrassed about the number of cars I have, but since I've heard some other numbers, it seems like I'm not that bad at all. Yeah, um, fortunate to be around where, where Luff was so that I could see new tracks every, he, he was a, in, he's an inveterate track builder. Uh, after about nine months or so of a new track, he, he starts getting itchy and then he has to build a new track. And I'm an inveterate uh, engineer and statistician, so I want to get lap times for all my cars, put it in a spreadsheet. And then Love goes and builds a new track. So then I have to start all over again. And uh, now he's moved over to the island, which is sad for us, but a good thing for him. Uh, been fortunate in uh, going around the country as well to, to meet some guys and, and drive with you. Stan, yeah, I've never been down to, to Las Vegas. We, we met obviously at Alan's place at the 24 hour. And uh, last year was actually a, a highlight for me because for the past couple of years, I've been participating in, in the uh, Tacoma 24 hour. And uh, last year I also got invited to, to race at the, uh, in the one in Michigan. So last year was a great year for me. I was on the winning team of two 24-hour races. So that was kind of neat. One thirty-second hard body. No, I mean, they just put me on the side there and said, you just shut up and you don't, don't bother us and we'll make sure we win. So, so you don't have to clap, Paul. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, 
I fortunately didn't let them down too badly. Uh, yeah, I'd actually had my flight booked for the 24 hour at Michigan again this year. And then all hell broke loose. So we're also, our group called the Greater Vancouver Slot Car Club, we're also Zooming. So we have a Friday night at the same time that we have uh, our normal racing. We have just a chat session on, on, uh, on Zoom. And we also, for the first time, we decided to do a semi-formal race series of uh, slotted group Cs. And I started a, a number of workshops and, and, and just to, to go over preparation. And COVID hit, so now we're doing a weekly uh, workshop on, on setting up the, the cars for, for that as well. So in spite of not racing, uh, we're still being active. And that's enough about me. All right, well, that was all appreciated. Uh, um, I, I wish I could get up there one of these days and, and race on some of those uh, tracks that Luff had a hand in. Uh, never met him personally, but definitely know of him through the internet. And of course, I'm selling his products now. Um, I assume that he's doing well. You said he moved to the island and that's good for him. So I haven't heard, you know, yeah, good for, or bad news. Some, so I assume. For some weird reason, he sent me an email with a number of puns and no comments, Paul, uh, on puns. It's, uh, yeah, so it's, I asked him how he's doing. He hasn't responded back yet, but everything I hear is settled in happily on the island, doing well. Excellent. Good to hear. Thank you very much for that, Alwyn. And let's go ahead and move to Graham, Mr. Dodsworth, if you'd like to share a little bit about yourself. You guys are pretty hardcore. <laughs> All of you. Most of the names I know, I'm on uh, SCI as NASCAR 03. So I've been on there for many years. Paul, you and I have talked a few times on the phone, I think, many years ago and stuff. So I know most of your names and stuff. Let's say I'm NASCAR 03. But when I started, I started out with a Line L, uh, 132nd racetrack back in, the, I want to say, 1960. And, geez, I don't see any Line L stuff around anymore. But it was, it was quality stuff. But that's what got me. And then in my early teen years, I discovered... Uh, the big eight-lane racetracks in Vancouver, 41st and Fraser for anybody who lived in the area. And so I used to go up and I used to race there and tried my hand at winding motors and, you know, blowing smoke out and, you know, stuff like that. So, and, uh, and I say I raced in my teen years and stuff, but, and then it was only about 2006, uh, my wife bought me a 132nd scale SCX set. So basically, I've followed Dave ever since, wherever he's gone, you know, <laughs> and SCX and Strombecker and stuff like that. So we've all, uh, or scale electrics, but, but the SCX is still what I'm running. I'm still running analog, and um, I, I just have fun with it in a spare room. I'm a real one-one car racer, drag racer, and uh, autocross and stuff, so... And I have lots of friends that do that. So when they when they come over, we have NASCAR nights at my place sometimes. And I set up a big track because when you're racers, you're racers. So I'll set up a big track and plunk a bunch of Corvettes or cars down. And so we have a good time that way. So um, I'd love to get into back into building my own cars again and stuff. You know, I do oh, <laughs> Corvette there by Paul. Yeah. So uh, that's what I race in real life is a C5 Corvette. So and a C3. But um, so I just like to play with the, with the hobby. I set it up. I have a 143rd Carrera for the grandkids when they come over. I probably have 100 feet of that stuff. And they come over and set it up in the living room. And, and otherwise, I'm 132nd SCX running cars around and uh, just having a good time. You know, I've routed my own stuff. If any of you guys have been around SCI for a long time, I'm the guy with the the trunk, the track in the trunk of my show car. So if you've seen that Monte, my Monte Carlo show car has a track in there and it has full timing. It's just a single lane. Again, it look, I've made it out like an autocross track. It's got parking lot lines and everything on it. And you can, and at car shows, then you can run cars in my trunk all day. Runs on 12 volt, all totally self-contained. So, so uh, just, I do that kind of stuff. I've routed my own tracks, you know, over the years. So. It's, uh, I just find the hobby is a lot of fun. I've met a lot of people. I say like Dave, I've talked to many times over the years. Brian Young, I, you know, 
still get in touch with him to, you know, to order stuff and to order parts and that. So, so it's just been, um, it's been a good hobby. And the one big thing that came out of it too was I'm also on that, uh, the deal was quit smoking, get a slot car a month. If any of you guys have seen that on SCI, that was a trigger for me to quit smoking. And I think the guy named was Rob HTPD cop or something. I think he started it and it was, uh, so I quit eight years ago and it was one of the, I guess the triggers that got me was, uh, he was running the thing where his wife offered him a car every month. And you know what? That seemed to be the trigger for me. I don't know why, but it, I did look at, it made me look at the expense of smoking and, uh, I quit the night I read that. And every month I got cars for a couple of years, not as much every month now, but, but that was kind of a trigger. So we post in there. I love to read about the stuff at SCI and what people are building and the scenic layouts. I'm also a model railroader. So scenic and a road racing layout is, uh, that's just amazing to me to see some of the work that people have done uh, just in there. Even uh, what Pinto girl, do people remember her on there? She did some amazing stuff for a couple of years, right? So uh, just people like that, the amazing tracks and everything, it's, it's good. So that's about it. Right now, I just, uh, I just play for fun. I don't follow anything in particular. I know Paul has tried to get me into proxy racing and stuff like that, you know, a while back. And, but um, I just enjoy playing it by myself. There's a guy in Maple Ridge that has a track. Sometimes we go to on the weekends and run around out there. And uh, never jumped into digital yet. But that's certainly a lot of nice stuff going on with that digital. So anyway, that's me, um, NASCAR 03. I just play for fun. All right. Thank you very much, Graham. And I remember that quit smoking thing on SCI quite a while ago. And good job, you know. I'm glad that worked for you. And it seemed to work for a bunch of other guys, too. So that's awesome. So good job. Yeah, some on guy jumped in there and jumped out again. But, you know, if, if you could not smoke for a week, you're even better off, right? So. Right. Yeah, every, every it, was, it was a good deal. Exactly. Good Wonderful. Luck. Good job. And Dave, would you like to do a quickie? Uh yeah, sure. Um well, um uh, I'm Dave. <laughs> uh I've met uh many of you and probably talked to most of you at some point. Um and uh I'm just uh taking pictures where I can these days and uh, I just shot the new DeLorean for uh, gtslots.com uh, tonight and uh, I'm taking pictures of sideways and cars for GT slots and I'm working on a project for him uh, something that uh, will be pretty exciting uh, if it happens um, anyway uh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, guys. All right. Thank you very much. And, and I'm sure we'll, I'm, you know, probably somebody will have a question for you at some point. Sure. Uh, on, next on my screen, I have Paul. Go ahead. Mr. Hodgson. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. All right. Hi, it's Paul here. What Coast Racer to all you guys. Uh, yeah, what, what a treat it is to see all of you on the screen. This is a great concept. Uh, get on you, Greg. You know, I didn't know about Zoom. My wife's in the choir, and they'll, she and the ladies that she knows in this French choir will be getting together using Zoom, which is really interesting. Um, but I thought, well, hell, if she can do, tackle the technology, it's going to be a, something I can do. <laughs> uh, Dave, really a treat to see you there. It's been a long, long time. Good to see you looking well. I hope you end up uh, one of these days getting that place in Rhode Island that you want. Hey, Curie Martin, you're a real treat to see you. And I see you with that half smoked cigarette. I'm, and I, boy, that takes me back a few years because, uh, yeah, I used to be a heavy duty smoker. Um, I'll win. Hey there. Um, uh, I'll tell you what, folks, uh, you discover things about people. And this is something I've liked about being on SCI for so long. You discover, uh, you make friends. You actually make a cybernet friend. You know, uh, it's, it's a very strange concept to me in a way. Um, but I mean, like um, Paul Komnacki and Canberra and uh, somebody else. I mean, Kevin there. Hey, hey, Kevin uh, from um, 
Isle of Man uh, and people from all around the planet. Uh, it's been really interesting to me being on SC. And as a mod, of course, I've got the advantage that uh, I want to know what somebody's email address is. Or, you know, I can look them up and I can get in touch if I want, you know, um, apart from private messages and so on. So, no, it's just been really interesting to me to make all these connections with people um, over the years. Uh, and, and even, uh, you know, uh, I'm in Vancouver here, which of course is the best place on the planet. And, um, you know, uh, I've had Robert Livingston at one time. He and his wife took a cruise out of Vancouver up to Alaska. So uh, I got to take them for lunch when they were here and off the boat. And then um, MS Water, or Charlie, he's, uh, he's a marine biologist. And he and his wife were up here a couple of years ago. And I got to spend the afternoon with them. So that's really interesting is, you know, you, you have to sit, back and forth with people for so long uh, via SCI and then actually to meet people is really pretty cool that uh, um, should I tell you about my slot history ah, hey what can I say I've, I've got a basement and I've got a uh, I've got a routed track that I made oh, quite a few years ago uh, I've also had a number of floods in the basement over the years which <laughs> have really stymied the amount of slot racing going on so right now I'm going through a rebuild, well not really a rebuild, it's a resurfacing of the track. I reached the conclusion that buying uh, silicone tires and keeping a pristine track all the time, which is, which you have to do really in my experience, was just driving me nuts. So I thought let's just do a Luff Linkert latex job, you know, repaint the track, sand it all back, repaint the track, and let's just, uh, so that's in progress right now. Um, just going back to a track that I'll run urethanes and rubber tires on. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's about, that's me, yeah. Excellent, thank you very much. And now we know you a little bit better. <laughs> and hey, Greg, and, uh, I have to say, by the way, uh, you know, credit where it's due. I don't think there's anybody in the whole freaking slot universe who knows as much about digital as you do. It, it's, it's totally over my head, but um, it's just really interesting to see what's going on in there and how your 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 comprehension of digital uh, and, and all the different scales and your objectivity about the system is really interesting to see. You're a real uh, you're a real gem in SCI, and you could you should tell Alan that he should give you a raise. <laughs> Two hundred percent raise, darn right. Right. Yeah, right. good, good luck. Maybe he'll buy you a beer, but I wouldn't hold my breath. <laughs> well, you know, 200% of zero is still zero. <laughs> exactly, yeah. That, that's what I make all the time these days. Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you very all much, right. uh, Mr. Wet Coast Racer. Clyde, would you like to give us a little bit of history? You're muted. You want me to unmute you? or? Okay. Okay, can you? Can you hear me? Okay, my name's Clive, uh, Drifter 2 on the forum. Um, got started when I was about 10 years old. We're at a kid's party and the parents took us upstairs to a place in Parramatta, which is west of Sydney. Um, had a big king track and you know, basically a normal slot car place. Um, had a hill climb track. and um, So, yeah, that was, that was fun for a few years. And uh, then I became a teenager and started chasing girls instead of slot cars. And then got back into it about 2009. Now I'm running a slot car business. I do parties, corporate events, that sort of stuff. I've got a portable track, take it all over the place. Um, pretty much enjoy all, all aspects of slot cars and building trucks um, to, to electronics. Uh, I don't really have a preference between analog or digital. Uh, it's all good fun. It's great fun interacting with everyone on the forum. Yeah, so yeah, back to you, Greg, thanks. All right, thank you very much. And Mr. Mileage7712, Phil, do you want to give us a little bit of history? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Mileage712 on Slot Forum. Uh, you know, I, I guess uh, my history's a lot like all the other guys. You know, as a kid, you know, I had uh, HO stuff, Aurora model motoring stuff, and then went through AFX, you know, got into riding dirt bikes and that distracted from my slot car hobby for a number of years. And then I went off and did some motorcycle riding, a little bit of motorcycle or racing, road race style, sport bikes. Um, and really didn't care much at all about uh, automotive racing or cars at all 
when I got into motorcycles. I, I love the performance envelope of motorcycles and it, it biased me in an unhealthy way. Um, and I got cancer. Uh, actually, I've had cancer five times, twice terminal. Um, I've had more than 75% of my liver removed and it grew back. That should have killed me in 36 hours after the surgery from liver shock, but I was too far to wait for a donor. So I got through all that in about 2015, my nephew said, Uncle Phil, you need to get rid of those HO slot cars you got downstairs in storage and get some 132nd scale slot cars. They look really cool. And my nephew, mind you, is about is in mid 40, so I and I'm older than him. So I said, This guy's out of his mind. And uh, we went over. I live in, in Michigan, and on the other side of the state is the Detroit area, and there was a hobby shop. We drove, I said, okay, I'll drive you over there and you can get some stuff. And when I left, I had uh, Scale Electric's uh, Grid Force slot car set, a, a raw power slot car set, and about 10 one thirty second scale slot cars. That was, on a, that was on a Thursday. And by Tuesday the next week, I had bought a, a, another guy that I knew who was who was selling slot car, his slot car stuff so he could buy his wife a show horse. And uh, so I went to his house and I, you know, he was going to sell me 15 cars for 300 bucks. So I, I bought those, you know, that was a really good deal, but he had 160 cars and uh, he was going to take all his stuff to a slot car show in Chicago and sell it all as one batch before he could get out of the driveway with it all. I bought all of it. So, <laughs> so, Suddenly I had five sheets of four by eight um, MDF and this uh, Scale Electrics uh, Sport track. And, uh, you know, Professor Motors, a company that makes some power supply. You guys probably know those guys. Professor Motor Power Supplies and Controllers. And I brought all the stuff home, put it in my basement, which was just a concrete hole uh, underneath my house. It's totally unfinished, two light bulbs in the ceiling. And that's where I started. And then I thought this should be more comfortable so I have been working on finishing my basement and it's very close to done. And I could finish the trim work and stuff if I could manage to come down here and, and not be distracted by my slot car set, which immediately causes me to not pick up paintbrushes, not do any work, and it's pretty good. And uh, so it, it's come along pretty good. You know, I, I have a half a, a or have a, a what will end up being a bathroom with a tub and a, a shower and everything in it but there's no tub or shower or anything in there because what I really needed was a toilet and a sink so my buddies could come over and race and not have to go upstairs to uh so we plumbed all that in built some walls around it went good to go <laughs> so <laughs> that's the state of my life um you know it, it's just a lot of fun I really don't have a a huge preference over analog or digital, though I have to say in recent time, I've really been enamored with uh, digital stuff, you know, along the, the lines of buying stuff. Um, and I probably own about, probably about 300, maybe 350 linear feet of, slot, of scale electric sport track. Um, and, uh, when I first bought, I, I, you know, the, the stuff I bought was about 120 feet, but I keep buying sets. So I bought like three uh, Sunset Speedways. I bought the recent 24-hour uh, uh, Le Mans digital set. Uh, I bought when it first, when I first discovered it, I bought the digital platinum set. So I bought that and I have the pro platinum GT set and I have uh I don't know, a couple of old ARC uh, one sets, and I've got the, what is it, the Fast and Furious set, and I've given away about a half dozen sets, of those, most of not the small ones, but the Sunset Speedways and stuff. So I've actually probably bought eight Sunset Speedways, but I only have three in my personal possession. So I keep collecting track and thinking one of these days, my I'm gonna, it's going to rain and my house is going to be three times bigger and then I can put all the track together, but it's, it keeps raining and the sun comes out, only the grass grows. So that's me. That's, that's, that's Milan 712. Well, thank you very much for sharing and good job kicking cancer's ass multiple times there. Yeah, uh, feels good.
love how slot cars is, is, you know, keeping you going and distracting you and keeping you busy and yeah. damn, that's a lot of sets. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I know yeah. guys who buy lots of sets, but damn, that's a lot of sets. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, analog maybe, and scale electrics, like it. <laughs> maybe scale electrics, you know, can, can, uh, you know, with, with the revenues to me, maybe they could stay open just one more hour and make one more car that I might have to buy, you know, so <laughs> that's how I look at it. You're single-handedly you keeping the stuff. company alive. <laughs> yep. Keep them going. Keep the keep slot All car right. industry going. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, Mr. Pugh, would you like to take, take a stab at it this time? Well, sure. Welcome back. I'm glad to see you guys. Uh, I'm Eric. I'm from East Tennessee. Um, Feel free to come down, visit our mountains, Dollywood, and come race at our slot car tracks. We got uh, two of them right here in town. Um, two weeks ago when I was on, I was talking a little, about, a little bit about digital and what I did and how I hacked up some Carrera stuff because I really like a wood track. Um, I kind of mentioned, let's see if I can do this without falling down. I think I brought a little show and tell. So any of you with Carrera stuff, you know, this is a single lane, lane change. And, and I said, don't be afraid to void that warranty because if you want a, a digital wood track, you're gonna have to. Um, this is the little lane change here. If you're familiar, you know, if you've got Skelectrix, they basically do the same thing, but they have what, double pointers, I think. It's a little different. Um, so what I do after I, I take it apart and you strip everything off of that piece, you, you, um, take the back off that, that there voids the warranty. <laughs> anyway, uh, then you, uh, you cut it down. I use a, a table saw and a miter box. I, uh, like I said, you just got to get right to it. In below is where all the electronics is. You just carefully remove the, it's no worse than working on a slot car. Uh, where the rails were, automotive body filler, because when it's then recessed into the wood track, and all it takes is a little rabbit, the thickness of the plastic, that's like what, a 16th of an inch? You just lay the copper tape right over top and you've got the, con the continuity you want. Uh, just like on the factory, it's got a red and a black. You attach those either to your copper, you know, do a power tap onto your copper rails or like I do, I just ran continuous power tap below the track right from the control unit and this little yellow and blue one here. I don't know if you can see that as well as I can, but that's your sensor uh, that you mount so many inches ahead of the lane change that when the car comes across, it triggers if you wanna do the lane change or continue straight. Um, also, if you want to remote mount your control unit, this is what it looks like on the inside. Once again, it's only a piece of plastic you know, kind of like a toy, but we're adults who play with toys, just a bit more complicated. You just strip it down, leave what you need, make the wires you need, and put it wherever you want to. Um, so when I work on cars, I don't really go for the super fast, you know, I might get a, a certain car and, hey, I put some tires onto it and I'll run that. I did buy a tire truer, that way I can really salvage a lot of standard Carrera or Skelectrix cars. You know, they're pretty good, especially for what you're paying for them. Uh, seldom do I get into buying aluminum wheels and tires. But one thing I really like to do is to take like, say, a fly car, can I get that? And then I'll put a digital chip and lights in there. So I'm gonna see if I can do this without dropping three cars in the floor. Let's see if I can get that, can you? There we go. 
So I like to take, like this was a slotted, repainted it into some uh, fantasy design that I like from uh, Pados. This uh, Lola was a fly, I liked it. I put lights and a chip, and we got our racer back here, their own fantasy that they provided. But you know, you, you wind up with lights that you can turn off and on. It's all the standard Carrera stuff that you're familiar with. And of course, well, there went my can of World's Fair beer from 1982. Unopened, probably even worse than it was when it was original. But you wind up with tail lights, and uh, you know, you can see when you hit the throttle and then the brakes come on. So that's really kind of what I, I like. My track is not a scenic track. It's uh, just some plaster cloth with some latex paint slopped around. Did some uh, rumble strips out of orange and white. Now I heard a few of you folks going back to the SCI days. Uh, someone I met as soon as I joined SCI and got reinvolved with slot cars was uh, Devalls. I, I don't know if you guys recall him. He formed the uh, Forums Cup for NASCAR. Uh, but Bruce, Bruce was a great guy. He used to come to my house. We ran on a little four by eight, then became a four by 12 track. I'd go to his house and we'd run slot cars. Yep. He, he taught me quite a, quite a bit, but you know, unfortunately he passed away and uh, it was a sad time and we miss him around here. So I think, oh, one other thing, going through the house, you gotta be careful what you find. Here's a bottle of wine. <laughs> from the late 90s. The important part of this is it's from Don Panaz, Panos, Panos, his winery, Chateau Elan. I was not into slot cars in the late 90s, but when I went there, it was close to Road Atlanta. When I went there and I saw an engraved bottle of a race car, I knew I had to have that. So I don't know if this Merlot gets better with time, but I don't think I'm going to open this one. I think I'm just going to leave it for a display piece. So um, it's really great to hear all these stories, you know, some names that we know, some names we don't know. And it's funny, it does sound like all of us, it's like, well, I rekindled my youth, or well, when I was 12, and then I found girls. So and there's this like 30 years in between. And it's like, oh, hey. I've got a HO slot car. I think I still have like one or two of my HOs from back in the day. So uh, they don't look that good, but you know, for sentimental. Anyway, I think that's about all I got to add. If anybody's got a question, uh, I'll be glad to answer it. Uh, message me on one of the forums. I go, well, I guess the only one I visit right now is Home Racing World. Uh, I'm just Eric P there. And remember, don't be afraid to void that warranty. All right, thank you very much for that and for doing the show and tell. I made your I made your screen big so that on the recording we'll be able to see all those things in pretty good detail. Uh, I think that pretty much goes through everybody with video. Is there anybody not using video who wants to use audio only to do an introduction on on here? Give a few seconds for anybody to hop in. Hearing none, I'll go ahead and open the floor to anybody who has any news or interesting stories slash reviews then we'll go into uh, show and tell like uh, like Eric was doing uh, and then Q&A so does anybody have any anything that happened recently uh, in the world of slot cars either just in general to them new products anything like that that they found interesting or want to talk about I haven't been looking I around an off the wall comment okay uh, because the topic has come up a couple of times and people who have been watching this video probably have seen me light up on a couple of occasions. There are now reports out of France where a substantial number of people smoke that smokers are about four times less, li less likely to be afflicted by the virus than non-smokers. Take it for what it's worth. It must be all the tar in your lungs, right? Actually, it appears that nicotine uh, is a major factor. Interesting. Well, hey, you know, silver lining, right? Right. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, since I didn't uh, hear anybody saying, oh, God, there was this awesome thing that we want to talk about, and I assume Dave isn't 
wanting to talk about any future things from coming from Skelectric anytime soon. I don't know. He shakes his head. Does anybody I have got old stuff? What's I got that? old stuff. Anybody remember these? Sure. <laughs> yeah, that's what I started with back in the day. This would have been back in the 60s, right? Oh, the controller. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I still got three or four of those. Yeah, sir. Yeah, I had two. One of them, the windings, just came all apart inside about two years ago. But this is my original one from probably 64. Great. Airfix. Do you still like a plunger controller or did you switch to triggers? Oh, I switched to triggers. He's got too hot, eh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember, remember running those on the big tracks, especially if you wound your motor, wound your own motor for about four volts. They just got hot. You know, the controllers got hot and everything, so. But yeah, I thought that's, uh, I say that's been in the, that's been in my slot car toy box for years, eh? So. I could never get on with uh, plunger controllers. I mean, even the, the, you know, like AFX that I had as a kid had cheesy little trigger controllers. Yeah. And Carrera still prefers plunger controllers for whatever reason. Oh. And I got some Carrera yes, digital and I, I can't, I mean, I can, I can do it, but I just don't feel like I have the same precision with my thumb. I've seen people actually hold the, the controller so that they can use their finger to work the plunger. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I got a, I got a um, digital racing solutions uh, controller for my career digital. It's standard trigger. Pretty much all the third party stuff is trigger. So it's good. You know, I wish part of I wish Parma was still around. Has anybody heard whether I heard a rumor a year ago they were coming back? But is that true? Like, so uh, I've talked with uh, someone that's friends with uh, with the Parma guys. Uh, they don't really seem, from what I had heard, they don't really seem terribly interested in coming back. So I guess yeah, well, that I, was I, just a rumor then. I need a couple of controllers and, you know, short of Parma was right in the middle of, you know, you either got the stock ones, you know, for $20 or you go up to Professor Motors or something like that, starting at oh, 150 in Canada, even more. And so there's, I don't find anybody filling that middle gap right now. You know, I want a yeah. controller with brakes on it. I don't find anybody filling that gap and I need two controllers right now. I'd like to get a couple and, uh, at 150 200 dollars a piece just for you know my i don't compete so i don't know what to get just a, a basic professor motor controller i don't think costs that much no. in canada <laughs> you try and land them in canada <laughs> you try and land them up here they're they're almost 200 almost 200 dollars a piece and there's nothing in that that middle ground anymore i've even no. looked and i know that uh scx had some pro controllers on two of their sets back then. Uh, yeah, we, we did. And they, they were sourced from Parma. We got a run of them done by Parma and I actually have two downstairs still in the package. Um, yeah. We, uh, it was, it, it was a great idea. I'm glad that, that they did it. It, it uh, they, they sold well enough. It didn't really get beyond that kind of first run. Uh, yeah, uh, I've talked with Maurizio about, about running, a making a cheaper controller. That's kind of a basic set replacement controller. Uh, and he doesn't really seem to be interested in that. He, he said that the, you know, the kind of SCP line is mm -hmm. the line that's the, you know, the kind of catch all controller for him. I uh, I see a huge hole in the market somewhere around sixty dollars for a controller, a, a good basic replacement controller yes. for a, a set. Um, uh, I don't see it happening. Yeah, I, I don't know what I'll do. I've got a whole bunch of the original green SCX ones, but the the plastic just breaks apart after many years. And understood. And then I know they come out with Parma replacements that were a little better. I never did have any of those, but those aren't can't be found anywhere. So uh, I, maybe I'll just step up and buy a couple of good ones. But as I say, up here in Canada, that's approaching three seventy five, four hundred bucks for two controllers, right? Graham, 
Yeah. Uh, you can, uh, I was just in uh, mini grid the other day and they've got the basic professor motor electronic controller for 85 bucks. In the U S no, that's mini grid. That's in Toronto. Oh, in mini grid. I didn't think they had controllers. I go there often, but I'll, I'll certainly try them, you know? Yeah. That's nice. Thank you very much. Phone first, obviously, because uh, ours, uh, you know, these days are funky, so you might want to phone and make sure someone's there. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll write them a note. I'll take a look online and write them a note. Thanks very much. Okay. That's, it's good that, they're, that you might be able to get some reasonably priced controllers from Minigrid, but it's, too, it's really too bad that there's nobody filling that void. I mean, all the set controllers have, have gone pretty much down. Uh, as far as quality uh, that I've seen, but you know, I'm not super knowledgeable on all the sets, but yeah, I mean, you pretty much jumped straight to a hundred plus bucks after cheesy set controllers. And now that Parma's gone, I'm not. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, nothing in that way. So yeah, maybe I, I can mean, 3D print something. I mean, I could 3D print the shell. Like, so if you've got Parma's or SDX's falling apart and we can get a, a model for the shell to put, the guts back into that's a 3d printing kind of thing for sure mm -hmm. but uh you, you got to have the guts first <laughs> if you don't have the guts or can make the guts you know wind your own resistor i don't know people winding their own motors and stuff it's it's a simple concept i'm sure mm -hmm. you should, i'm sure you could construct something just like they did but that's that's for tinkerers you know you want to be able to just you know go to a website or, or a store and, and be able to plonk down 50 bucks for a, a, a half decent controller for all your other people racing on your track you know you've got the professor motor or slaughter or whatever you know mm -hmm. third, whatever you like <laughs> but for the guests who barely ever race and they're gonna, they're just as likely to drop the controller or run yeah. off and it's still in their hand you don't want to give one them thought a buddy of mine a buddy of mine had one thought he's a dealer up here for carrera i think in maple ridge and he, uh, he said, you could move to wireless and digital. And he said, instead of having the chip in the car, you put the chip on each lane. So then you could use the wireless, and I don't know whether he was talking about Carrera or Scale Electrics, wireless controllers. He said, you put the chip on the lane, and then that way you can run any analog car. And then you could at least use the wireless controller and the digital chip will also have, I guess, some adjustable braking built in. I've never played with that stuff. So, probably talking about Carrera then uh, to be able yeah. to have adjustable brakes. Um, but yeah, that I mean, that's certainly something that you could do. It's risky because if yeah. you pop a car down on on a track that's too much motor for that chip, it'll bop, it'll pop the chip. Or yeah. if you short the rails while you're giving it power, it'll pop the chip. You know, there's, okay. there's lots of ways that it could be damaged, but if you're careful, you could do that. And yeah, those those uh, Carrera or Scalextric or even now the new SCX Advance uh, wireless controllers are pretty reasonably priced because they're mass produced. Uh, the, the new Scalextric digital uh, controllers, the wireless ones, are, are actually fairly ergonomic, uh, feel good okay. ergonomically, and they're very reasonably priced. Scalextric Digital doesn't have adjustable brakes unless you route the whole thing through a computer to, to change things. Oh, but I see. It's either on or off. Yeah, uh, Jeff is showing off one of the Scalextric Digital controllers there. Oh, okay. Uh, they're yeah, these, good feeling controllers. These are actually 30 bucks. So you'll get, and you have, if you get the Arc Pro or any of the Arc line, I'm guessing, you'll get two with it. Now, obviously, if you can run six maxed out, you'll have to get four more. So I did that, and they're only thirty bucks. Now that's mm. not Canada; that's U.S. So, yeah. But they do have vibration in it, so if you have a uh, wreck or some sort of breaking, it will have some vibration in it. It's kind of cool. You know what would be really cool? Skelectric just um, did some more advertising for its um, spark plug product, which is uh, a wireless dongle that you plug into your uh, your analog. Uh, controller input and then you control it wirelessly with an app on your phone what would be okay. really neat yes. is if you could connect like that Scalextric digital wireless controller to the spark plug or some other uh, wireless yeah. controller to the spark plug so you can have a proper you know slot racing controller for 
I mean, obviously they're targeting kids, uh, you know, or, or mm -hmm. people at least who are new to the hobby to, to be using their phone to control a car, but I don't see that beating a, a proper trigger with a, a spring on it so you can, you know, do real, real slot car racing. But I wonder where. if the technology is similar enough that there might be a way to convince the, the Arc Pro controller to talk to the spark plug. <laughs> it probably is. You just have to rewrite all the firmware. I don't know. Have you seen some other way to look at it? First person uh, shooter games on phones. <laughs> <laughs> What's another yeah. way to look at it? The, the another way to look at it might be to look around and see if you can find any of the Omni conversion kits that were made some years ago. Uh, for the uh, Pharma style controller. Uh, these were basically PC boards uh, with a diode array in them instead of a resistor. Uh, it's Omni? They had similar contacts, but of course the advantage of a diode array uh, is that the voltage drop across the diode is fixed and independent of the load. So instead of needing a 5 ohm, 10 ohm, 30 ohm, 60 ohm resistor, uh, it's a uh, it's a simple linear voltage uh, uh, adjustment that will work for essentially any load up to the maximum capacity of the diodes, which, as I recall, were typically about uh, 15 amps or so. So in most cases, you're mm. very unlikely to exceed that. Yeah, and These you said the name was Omni. Omni. O M N I. Yeah. Okay. I'll look that up too. That's cool. That's why I'm on here. And basically, an, a, a basic electronic controller, as opposed to using diodes instead of a, a coiled instead of a wound resistor, you're using mm -hmm. a series of diodes. That's correct. And some of them use a series of resistors, um, but it's still got a it's got a wiper board that then has contacts that go through all those things. And That's they sold right. that as a kit to to put into a Parma handle. Yes, they did. Yeah, I uh, I remember buying one. Uh, Oh, probably 20 some odd years ago. Uh, it's the kind of thing might, that might still be around uh, in, you know, someone's bag of what the hell am I going to do with this stuff? Graham, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't hold your breath on the Omnis. Um, I, I, if I were you, I'd, I'd spend 80 or 90 bucks and get a Professor Motor basic electronic controller. And, yeah. Yeah, right now it sounds like that's going to be the easiest. Uh, yeah. Well, my my digital buddy, he was the one. He said, "If you're going to spend that kind of money, why don't you go wireless?" And you know, of course, he had these ideas, and I went, "Well, maybe that will work." You know, but it is a shame that Parma doesn't fill that uh, that center gap for controllers anymore. So. Yeah, and you know, this is the kind of thing where an enterprising per person, not like me, would be able to. <laughs> would be able to design, I mean, there's a, there's actually already a couple of uh, slot car controller shells um, freely available for download and, and 3D printing. I've downloaded oh. them, I haven't printed them, but they're, they are, I think one of them is like for, I mean, they're, they're basically designed for a specific set of guts, right, uh, to be put into it. Like I saw one was a conversion for an AFX controller um, one looked very similar to a Parma. It's a, um, uh, very similar in shape. Um, I don't have a Parma to compare it with, but same design with the wiper and. I mean, it's just the plastic shell, right? So they they didn't show the guts that go in it. But what somebody could certainly do is design the the circuit board, and you know, you can have those circuit boards made, you know, by China. Or there's a, probably even yes. places in the states that can print you a circuit board that's exactly like what you would need to stick into one of those shells. And then all you've got to do is either pay them to do the soldering and, and you know, put the electronic components on there or design it for, you know, for, for, for uh, through hole components and solder it all together yourself and, and, you know, charge hopefully somewhere in that 50 buck range for yeah. the guts and, you know, cause you can just, print the shell every time you need a shell to sell somebody a, a, a controller but yeah it's when you when it's small numbers you end up with a higher price right if i was putting those things together by hand yeah i probably wouldn't <laughs> i probably wouldn't want to no. sell them for 50 bucks <laughs> no graham if you're looking for uh if you want a resistance controller uh go on to pendle's website 
look under controllers and look at the DS range of controllers. Is that and the pendle slot out of England? Yeah. Yeah, and DS was the other one I was trying to think of. Those, those are good controllers. Yeah, What's makes, their... uh, you know, they make they make a range of controllers, but they do make um, you know a pretty affordable resistance type controller. The only issue with the resistance type controllers is you really need, depending on what card, you need like two or three of of, of different resistances, unless you're only running one specific motor and that's all you're interested in running. So the beauty of spending another 20 or 30 bucks for the electronic controller, it doesn't really matter if you're running a 14,000 RPM S can or a 40,000 RPM S can. They sort of oh, okay. be much the same. Basically think of an electronic controller in real simple terms, it's, it's not accurate, but it's basically a voltage range. So as you squeeze the, the, the trigger, you get more volts coming through and away the car goes. So they're nice and cool. They run well with a big range of motors and it makes a big difference to your enjoyment of the hobby. Trust me. Uh, Very good. Just saw on the chat, the slot head asked, uh, years ago I bought two Professor motor con electronic controllers that plug directly into Skelectric power base. Anyone know if they are still available? I remember those controllers, but I don't know if they're currently available. You can yes. Oh, let me <clears throat> let me send the guy, Professor uh, Professor Motor. Let me send him a text and see if he answers. I'll ask that question. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, he does. And I say, by the time I land him here in Canada, and there's nobody sells them here in Canada except Mini Grid or what's a Raceway? I think is a place in Toronto. Race Haven. Race Haven, yeah, I've looked there, and I don't think they had the Professor Motor controllers. But I say it was just a thing. I was, I wanted to fill something. I had a couple of Parmas before, and uh, I wanted to get two more of those, and there just seemed to be nothing in that gap anymore, you know. And I don't mind stepping up. I know the Professor Motor ones are, you know, and others are really good, and they're made to work a special way and made to last. But uh, I, it just kind of blew me away when I had to spend. 350 bucks to get a couple of controllers you know well i'll tell you what it's it, it looks to me like there is at least a, a small bump in the slot car hobbyist uh, numbers simply because of everybody being stuck at home you know all the facebook oh. groups have been having just tons of new members you know asking all kinds of questions and stuff so you know if we're lucky then then that that little uh, tide will kind of stay or maybe keep going up a little bit when you know people start uh, continuing those hobbies that they've uh, come to through this process and maybe there's going to be a market for a, a reasonably priced mm -hmm. controller so maybe somebody out there you know if you're watching this hey we need a mid a mid-range analog controller you know we don't need adjustments we just need a, a half decent one better than set but not third eye <laughs> yes do it there you go I can survive. You'll figure it out. We're not we're not sure. worried about you. We're worried about all those people who want to step up a little bit, but yeah. they don't want to drop 150 bucks. You want to show us something, Mr. Martini? Yeah, uh, I thought I'd interject a little bit of history here. Yeah. Uh, this is a, uh, bring it up here. This is a vintage 1960 scratch built car uh, and where a lot of it started out. It's a van wall. Uh, the shell is a Merit model shell. Uh, this car does not run anymore because uh, uh, after all these years, this plastic is pretty brittle. But it was my solution to uh, what I perceived as a problem, which turned out to be not. And of course, I think I've learned a few things about slot car engineering since then. Uh, at that time, I made the assumption that since a very rigid chassis uh, is a good thing in a one-to-one -one car, that a very rigid chassis could also be a good thing in a slot car. Uh, and uh, this is what I came up with. Get things apart here without breaking something. Oh, come on. This was hogged out of a uh, single slab of aluminum wow. on a large bridge port mill. 
I bet that does not flex at all. Uh, no, it does not. Uh, it's a Pittman DC-703 in the back. Uh, and at the front, this is sort of interesting, uh, before there were commercial guides available, I ended up building my own. Uh, and this guide was carved out of a basically, I had a piece of Teflon, uh, milled it into a T-shape. Oh, I think I had about a foot of it. Sliced a piece off, reshaped it a little bit, uh, and that became a guide. And that is a vintage, about, about 1959 or 60 slot car. Um, the extension of the story is this, which I'll try to do fairly quickly. Uh, that's a Pittman motor. And Pittman motors were very popular in slot cars uh, uh, until the Japanese uh, can motors took things over. Well, how did that come about? It came about because, you know, a number of references have been made to girdles here on this forum and the advent of girdles and the effect in slot cars. Usually <laughs> negative, here's one that's positive. Uh, at that time, I was engaged to a young lady, a fellow graduate student, uh, who lived in Perkasie, Pennsylvania. The help was Perkasie, Pennsylvania. It doesn't matter. The next town to Perkasie was Sellersville. Sellersville was the home of Pittman Motors. On one of my visits down there, we went over to Pittman Motors, and I met Charlie Pittman. And Charlie Pittman was working at his stand-up desk in a space not enclosed, but just adjacent to the slot, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, shop floor, where they made model train locomotive uh, engines and motors. I showed him what I had, and he was intrigued. Uh, and about three weeks later, a package arrived with a couple of uh, Pittman model train motors, uh, which had been revised with a brass U-bracket bracket attached to the back and a pinion uh, and crown gear and an axle. Uh, and he asked for my opinion, which I, I put them in slot cars. I fed the opinion, the, the opinion back to him. Uh, but those are, I'm quite certain, uh, the first slot car motors that Pittman ever made. Uh, and one of them is now in the Alaskan Museum uh, in uh, Southern California. I still have the other one around here somewhere. I won't give that one up. But anyway, uh, it turns out the ro you know romance on one hand is a bad thing. On the other hand, it's what got Pittman into slot cars. <laughs> Did that you marry the girl? Sorry? Did you marry the girl? Uh, yes, I did. <laughs> there you go. And actually, you know, interestingly enough, uh, she was as ardent about the slot cars as I was. And not long after we were married, she demanded her own car. Uh, I found a, I believe it was a Revell model of a Mercedes 300 SLR convertible. Uh, I machined another aluminum chassis. This one uh, shaped a little bit differently because so it allowed a complete cockpit uh, and it was finished with a female driver uh, and a uh, blonde ponytail sticking out of the end of the helmet. Um, I'm going to get a little bit maudlin at this point. Uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, I assisted my son uh, in closing up his mother's apartment uh, after she had died. We'd had very little contact for about 30 years. We were divorced some years ago. Uh, and much to my surprise, there, in a place of pride on one of her shelves, was the 300 SL. That is awesome. End of story. Way before my time, but I love hearing about all that kind of stuff. I remember looking at uh, the, the history of slot cars and seeing the Lionel stuff, and I'm like, really? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I was out of slot cars for about 30 years. Um, after we had moved my wife and I had moved to California. We found a, a slot car track. We were in San Diego, or actually in La Jolla. We found a slot car track in El Cajon. Uh, went out there with my slot cars that I brought from the east uh, and were soon doing very, very well. It was a simple kind of arrangement. Uh, everybody anteed up, I don't know what it was, two or three dollars to run the evening's races. 
And at the end of the evening, uh, the uh, pot was, uh, part of it went to the owner, part of it uh, was given to the, uh, to the winner. And uh, so on a number of occasions, we had a very nice stopover for uh, coffee and something on the way home. One night, Chap showed up with a, uh, an 804 uh, Porsche. And these are 124th cars. And this car had two Pittman DC 703s in the back with four rear, rear tires. Um, my comment was that there's nothing like that out there. Uh, the response was, I think from people who were tired of me winning all the time, was no, but it might have been. Uh, and that, and in subsequent months, more and more bizarre looking cars started to show up. Um, I've always been a scale modeler. I saw where things were going. Uh, I packed my cars away uh, and walked into a place called the Model Ship Chandlers in downtown La Jolla and bought a ship model. Uh, and uh, for most of the next 30 years, my competitive energies went towards sailboat racing. Mm. Anyway. Yeah, the slot cars definitely get pretty darn competitive, but I imagine sailboat racers get pretty darn competitive too. Uh, yeah. And, you know, actually in many respects, there, 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 there is a simple, there is a similar gradient. Um, I raced in what are, was called one design classes where parameters are set. Uh, on one hand, there are even more strict classes like a class called the fin, where at uh, top level competition, uh, all of the boats are handout boats. Uh, and then there's another stage on the other side where, yes, there are specs, but you have a lot of leeway uh, in them. Uh, I was sort of in the, uh, in the middle on that. Very cool. Uh, did anybody have any Q&A? Uh, anybody who's new to the hobby want to pick some brains here or anybody who's... Greg, I got a question. It me. Um, I listen to all, everybody talk, and there's a lot of people in here to have a lot of different um, type of cars. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm SCX. I'm switching over to Scale Electrics, but I've been looking um, at, at different cars, and I came across uh, Re Revo slot cars. And so I was wondering, do any of you guys have any of those? And, and I'm... And if you watch any of the other videos, I'm not the person who's going to get the car, tune it, and find it. And true, I get the car out of the box and run it on the track. And so I'm just wondering, how does it run, you know, just out of the box? Um, is it a good made car? Because I, I, I've never heard of it. So um, that, that's kind of my question and pick up your guys' expertise on, on that company as far as their make of their cars. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll just do my quick opinion. I have one, I have one Revo slot car uh, and I love it. Uh, straight out of the box, put it on the track, have fun. Uh, you know, depending on your track, uh, you know, you might need to swap the tires out for something with a little more traction. They're metal chassis um, and I don't believe it even came with a magnet. So, <clears throat> but, um, you know, they run great because that metal chassis keeps the center of gravity nice and low. You know, the, the stock tires actually have, you know, decent traction even on my sport track. So I could, I could uh, hoon it around quite enjoyably. Um, they're good cars. Anybody else want to take that question? Kelly, you run with magnets, don't you? you know, oh, you're still muted, Kelly. Yeah, I do, but I'm... Um because I'm switching over with my all my SCX cars and the power that they have, I'm thinking that that power is what's blowing out my chips with the magnet and the motor. And so I'm in the process of taking out some of the magnets for the ones that I'm going to chip over, but um, I'm open to, to race with any, with, with magnets or without magnets. Okay. No, I mean, obviously the, I mean, the Revos don't come with magnets. Um, you can certainly add magnets to them. You're also going to have to put it, if you run digitally, you're going to have to drill a hole in the Revo chassis. And that's an, that's going to be a little more difficult for you because it's an aluminum plate chassis. 
So, you, you, I mean, you can't punch a hole in it as easy as you can a piece of plastic, but I mean, it's, it's still certainly doable. Um, if you like the Revos, get one. I mean, there's no, there's no bad cars being made. They're all fine. Um, you know, some are better than others and some are designed this way and that way, but there's no reason not to get a Revo whatsoever. If I could comment. Um, so I have this here. I bought it a little while ago. I've yet to run it because I've not put a chip into it. Um, it is, as far as a model goes, it's beautiful. Ball bearings on the, uh, uh, instead of bushings, um, it, it does have a motor that's mounted really super low. So the magnetic effect of the motor is probably even greater than, well, all on par with a slotted or an NSR, this angle wind, wind, winder design. Regarding the chip, um, I don't know if you can see where my finger is, but get the light here right. There's a rectangle for a Carrera um, switch, and then just to the side of that is the hole for the LED. Now, I know there are some Skelectric folks here and maybe some SCX guys. I'm not sure how that's going to play with that for you, but uh, I eventually we'll get around to putting a chip in this and, of course, lights. But um, it's just looking like a really tremendous car. Um, the word was on the forum, it's like, yeah, you'll love it, but run it with other Revos. Uh, apparently, I'm going to say that a slotted or an in, that an NSR is going to best it a little bit because this is 110, 109 grams, which those other cars are 80 grams. Um, this is more on the lines of a, uh, a portly Carrera, shall we say. Yeah, it's a, those, those Revo slots, my, <clears throat> my nephew and I, when we first got in, we ran into some Revo slot cars, and so we ordered them up. Um, I didn't really dislike it, but, you know, we only ordered a couple of them. I ended up giving mine to my nephew so he'd have a pair of them so he'd, he'd be able to race them against each other because they work pretty heavy. And even after some tuning and messing around with it, and at that time I was such a neophyte. I had a buddy of mine who's raced a, a lot of slot cars and done a lot of nationals and stuff and in the HO arena. And then he was doing uh, – uh, Thirty-second scale stuff and trying to apply his his uh, historical skills to tuning those. So he he at least had a clue, and he did a bunch of stuff to him. Took about two and a half seconds per lap out of the lap times for those cars, but still we found that you know taking the scale electrics out of the box uh, and you know putting it on the track, it still you know had fifteen to twenty grams less. Uh, weight and the scale electrics would you throw the silicon tires on it put sills on the the Revo slot and my my tracks a scale electric sport track it's plastic and you know I race with magnets I'm I'm kind of a guy that you know uh, someone said they had 900 cars that was Ryan wasn't it <laughs> I'm glad I I'm glad I heard that because everyone says that I've got a problem and since 2005 I've only bought 360 cars so, you know, I think I'm pretty healthy compared to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, I've been actively buying, I guess, since about 2017. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, uh, got it it's way been worse. an addiction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got it way worse than me. I was buying in 2015. So right. I got two more years on you and a third the number of cars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but back to the Revo slot thing, Kelly, you know, I, I'm kind of like this. After I got over the... I won't say the shock, you know, but I, I kind of got past, wow, there's a lot of componentry on this Revo slot car. There's a lot of cool stuff on it. You know, it's very modular, uh, really cool. I mean, for, for messing around and setting up, it had so many options and opportunities. If you were going to use one to learn stuff, I think it would be great to, to have one to learn stuff. It's kind of like having a slotted or, you know, a racer sideways or something, you know, and and these cars have a lot of different things you can do. And, and there's lots of articles and, and, you know, on the internet, uh, you know, there's model car racing magazine, which 
published a lot of articles on how to tune various cars that have motor pods in them. That's where you got the, the motor mounts in a little box that then mounts in the chassis. So, you know, I think if you found one and you went, wow, it's cool to have my collection, do. You know, it's slot cars, you know, check it out. There might be something cool to you that, you know, I, I, I race sometimes and there's a club close to me. One of the guys that was on here recently was from the Kalamazoo, Michigan area, which is where I am. He was talking about John Lacko and the Gilmore Car Museum. Uh, here's a, you know, uh, what do I call it? A gratuitous uh, plug for Gilmore Car Museum. I don't work there, but I volunteer there. It is the arguably the world's largest historical automotive museum. It is 92 acres of car museum. So pretty impressive. Um, you know, it's a, it's a really awesome place, lots of buildings. Uh, and we have a, a club that has a slot car track there that runs analog. And, uh, you know, you take the Revo slots over there and you put them on a big track and it's a scale electric sport track. You know, it's plastic, it's four lanes, uh, but it's a lot of fun to race on. Uh, you know, I, and when I say, but I don't mean that apologetically. Actually, I'm kind of a guy that I love to introduce people to slot cars and the slot car tracks. And one of the things that I always try and make sure I do is that I don't take them to a wood track right off the jump. Because then they look at that and they think, I could never have that, or that's way too big. Or if I don't, if I don't aspire to get to that, then I'm never going to be a good hobbyist. So then they don't, they don't get in. Where I think, you know, when you show them, a, a lot of times I didn't even show them my home track, which is a pretty reasonably reasonable size track but I'll I'll set up four uh, white plastic folding tables and put a piece of green cloth on top of it and set a track up and show them that way that way they're basically running from a kit uh, but my point about the Revo slot is you put it on a bigger track you know and, and it's got requires some driving skills I think then it's like all slot cars. You'll race people with similar lap speeds or similar class clock cars. And, and at that point, they're a lot of fun to run. You know, I, I wouldn't hesitate to buy one again, knowing what I know now, even though I was foolish enough to give my nephew, who still owes me for over 300 cars that I bought because of him uh, and will never pay me. He also owes me my Revo slot back. <laughs> And, and to kind of build on that, and, and I think we might have mentioned this earlier, and this is my personal opinion, I think you should endeavor to buy as many different types of cars as you can. Having a Revo, having a Slotted, having a Fly, having a Skelectric, SCX, you know, one of, you know, as many brands with different manufacturing techniques and designs and, and you know, tolerances and quality and everything like that, you know, NSR, you know, Racer, all those you know, one of each. But what, what I would say to, to you, Kelly, and anybody else who's in a similar situation, getting, you know, being a digital person, when I first started, I was primarily digital. And when I was buying cars, I would also buy a chip to put in it. Well, I was buying all kinds of different cars and putting chips in it. But it was kind of pointless because these cars would never, you know, either historically ever race on the track because they were just different types of cars, but also in a slot car race, they really wouldn't be in the same race because they're just not competitive with each other, right? So if you've got four Revo slots, chip them. But if you've got one Revo slot and a slot it and an NSR, don't chip them. Just, just drive them by themselves in analog mode and enjoy the car for what it is. But until you have at least four of the same kind of car, same manufacturer at the very least, same uh, type of car, you know, like slot at group C, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, a dozen different group C bodies, and then, you know, dozens of liveries for each of those bodies. That's a type, you know, you could race, you know, four or six of those, definitely chip them. But if you've only got one of them, then don't waste the time or money putting a chip into a car that's only ever going to be by itself anyways. Yeah, that, and that's why, and that's why I was saying that early on, you know, when, when my nephew and I, before I got digital stuff, because the, the way I got digital was I, all the stuff that I described that I bought in that first, you know, 10 days of, from having no 130 second scale slot car track 
and then suddenly I was buying all this guy's stuff and his his track was a four lane analog track that that pretty much covered uh, five sheets of four by eight plywood. So I mean he had a he had a lot of track, but it wasn't digital. It was analog. And so when we were running analog, you know, we ordered those real slots in and my nephew, uh, he took, he had bought a couple kits and had them just on his basement floor. So because he had a two lane track, I let him take the Revo so he could race against each other. You know, I'll, I'll add to what uh, Greg's saying and say, if you're going to chip your cars, you do need, you know, to me, you get cars that run similar lap times that you know you want to run together. You know, like I've got a, a couple of Carreras that are DTM cars, and they run a, in, in analog mode. They run about a 10-second lap on my track. And the Revo slot ran about a 10-second lap. So if I still had my Revo slot, if I were going to chip, I'd have to put Scalectrics chips in my Carrera cars and in the Revo slot and then something else that runs 10 seconds so I could have four people run digital or, you know, in the case of scale electric setup, you know, three these days, cause I live alone. I said, I said, oh, hear that guys? That's Miss, Mrs. Booby Trap. So that's, that's my fiance. And I was gonna do one quick show and tell, honey, don't talk. I'm just, I'm gonna show the guy something real quick on my, I'm having my uh, Zoom chat wine and I slot see. car party. So, guys, this this right here, Mary is my fiance. She's on speaker. This is her box of cars. And so, really, the show and tell that I was going to tell you guys about before she called was was uh, one of the guys said he was zero for two in marriages. I am also zero for two, but I'm I'm relatively freshly uh, engaged to Mary. Um, when I thought I was going to die, I, I, I kind of walked away from that relationship because I didn't want her to have to carry me to my grave on her back. And I was fortunate enough to, to reunite with her and um, engage. And I have to say, it's fantastic to have a fiance who loves to race slot cars. She, she doesn't really like to come over and run laps. When she's here, what she wants to know is, Hey, can you turn on, you know, a race management program and can you set up a race? Can we race? And as long as we're racing, she's, she's here, you know, four or five hours, she's here slot car racing on a Friday night, you know, and I got to say, that's, that's a pretty good life because I'm talking Friday night before coronavirus. I'm talking Friday <laughs> night when the, you could be out dancing, you know, I've got a boat at the Marina, you know, we could be at the boat at the Marina. I got motorcycles in the garage. I got a 78 Fiat. So there's all kinds of options. And she would be willing to just slot car race, you know, on a beautiful day. So uh, pretty, pretty handy. But anyway, I'm going to mute guys and, and go talk to the future Mrs. Carpenter. She's definitely a keeper. <laughs> yeah. And this is going to be, I'm going to be one for three for the rest of my life. So all right. hope I live a long time, guys. <laughs> Darn right. Thanks for sharing, Phil. Looks like we're coming up on our two hour mark. We've still got about mm, 15 or 16 minutes left. Did anybody else have any questions or show and tell or chatting or? I'd like to jump in for a minute. Go ahead. Um, a couple of different things. Uh, you know, as I said, I'm zero for two and there sure as hell will not be a number three. I mean, you know, eventually you'll learn. But uh, a piece of philosophy, if you will. I have taught at the, uh, undergraduate, the graduate, and the medical school level. Uh, and after I retired, I spent a lot of time uh, tutoring uh, high school and junior college students in the sciences. Uh, one of the things that I would never countenance was the response that I can't do that or this is too hard for me. Now, where am I going with that? Uh, it's sort of a, a little bit of advice, if you will. You know, I'm old enough to be a bore about this kind of thing. Uh, to some of the questions that have been asked. Our local group comprises about varying from 17 to about 23 or 24 people. Uh, we race at a number of home tracks in about a roughly 100 mile radius uh, centered around uh, the Baltimore-Washington corridor. Most of the people in the group have come in uh, basically with 
their boxes of a few ready to run cars started racing. What I have observed over, I guess it's now been 25 years that I've been member, a member of this group, is that many people who started out with right out of the box cars over time uh, have found uh, both the uh, founder acquired the skills and the appetite for playing with the cars. First tuning them and then modifying them, uh, changing tires, changing gear ratios, uh, fiddling with how tightly the car, the bodies are tied onto the chassis and so on and so forth. Don't say that you can't do it or this is too complicated or you don't understand. Try it. The worst that can happen is your car will run a little bit slower and you'll figure out a way to make it faster. The side benefit of this is that in doing this kind of playing around and observing uh, how the car behaves when it goes this way or that way uh, will make you a more observant and more effective driver. So there's more pleasure to be found, more interest to be found, and opportunities to be found. Don't say that I can't do it. Absolutely agree with that. I mean, always be willing to, to, to fiddle. Uh, you know, just like you said, you know, I started with mostly ready to run stuff and, you know, through the clubs, you know, in the area that I joined, started to learn more and more, you know, the other guys' cars would be better and faster. And I'd say, hey, what you, you know, what did you do? <laughs> Can you help me? Or, you know, and then, you know, of course, buying the car to race alongside them, you know, you start turning the screws a little bit just to see what happens. Mm -hmm. Just and like I said. If you're in a good group, the others in the group will be more than happy to share what they know, what they have learned, and, and, uh, and their advice. So, uh, uh, you, know, give it, you know, give it a try. What do you have, what, what do, you have to lose? You're yeah. not earning your living at it. It's not life and death. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so, you know, Kelly, when you start getting into the other brands, just play with it, you know, ask people. You know, even if you don't have anybody, uh, you know, in your area that races and tunes those kind of cars, you know, we've got the forums, we've got, you know, even if this stops, you'll still have forums and all that stuff for, for people to, to help you out with that. Uh, but, you know, we'll do this every week until we get bored of it. <laughs> so we'll have this too. <laughs> Whenever I buy cars, I always buy two. If you bought two Revos and you don't like the way they race against your other cars, you've always got two Revos to race against each other. So, you know, I find if I buy two Carrera, you know, a Carrera car, then I always buy two Carrera cars, you know, similar. You know, you can always, they're always fun to race against each other, right? Yeah, it definitely. And, and Carrera, getting two Carreras is a lot easier than getting two Revos. <laughs> yeah, I wish, I mean, I can't deny the, the, uh, the engineering and manufacturing quality of a Revo slot. So, I, you know, it makes sense that that price is up there. You know, same with Slotit and NSR and stuff. Slotit's definitely a good value. I mean, those cars are, are just great cars and, and usually somewhere, you know, slightly above 50, you know, below 70 in that range as opposed to, you know, Revo slots or NSRs that are almost always 80 plus. But, you know, they're all good cars. So, you know, get them in your collection, enjoy them, learn from them. Well, here's a, here's a question for the group. It doesn't matter, analog or digital. When you think about the brands that you have a choice from, I noticed that the new Apple Porsches have just come out. I think they've been all over my feed. Do you look at something at a car and say, man, I've always liked that car. I don't give a damn what the manufacturer is. I've always loved that car, and it's a piece of history. I want it. I don't care. I mean, knowing you'll tweak it, do whatever you want to, or as you guys refer to them, it'll become a shelf queen and I'll never put it on track. Do you kind of go with your gut on that one? It's like, yeah, this may be a lower tier, but then you'll still put out nice stuff. And that's a car I've always wanted. I'll go get that. I'll go first. Uh, yes and no. Uh, I started off buying pretty much anything that looked half cool. Uh, and then of course I started, you know, trailing off my collecting habits to, to something I either needed for 
uh, the, the groups that I'm racing with because we decide, okay, we're going to run slot at group C. And so I needed a slot at group C. Um, I actually didn't, I've never really been into motorsports. Uh, I learned pretty much all I know about cars through this hobby. Um, I've started watching a little bit of motorsports, you know, as a result of that. But generally speaking, the cars that I see and need to have, regardless of the quality of the manufacturer or my expectation of the quality, are going to be pop culture stuff. You know, like I'm going to buy the, the the Back to the Future car that Skelectric just came out with um, and, and other cars like that. Uh, cars, you know, I'm a Transformers fan, you know, Transformer robots. And of course they were cars, right? So I bought slot cars that were just like the cars that Transformers turned into, you know, a, a red Lamborghini Diablo and, you know, uh, uh, yeah, there's Back to the Future there from Dave. Uh, so I buy cars that I love the look of. And, and just like you're saying, I don't care what the manufacturer, you know, quality, you know, and I'll run them around the tracks. I'm a no shelf Queens kind of guy. Uh, whether or not I'm going to race it, it's coming out of the box, going on the track and getting run around at least a little bit, if not regularly, if I like it enough. The other side of that coin is I'm a sucker for blue and yellow. And I, tra and I traced it back to having a blue and yellow bicycle as, a, as, a, as a, a young boy. And pretty much any blue and yellow car, I'll buy. So anytime we're, we're looking for new cars for the next series, I'll look for a blue and yellow one. If I can't find a blue and yellow one, I'll have a blue and yellow livery made of, <laughs> of whatever car that is, if, if possible. Yes, Sunoco is definitely high on my list. Got lots of Sunoco cars. Uh, there's a real nice looking group five, uh, sideways group five Sunoco. Uh, was it a Mustang or something like that that's coming out? I'm, I'm stoked to get that at some point. Um, but yeah. Oh yeah, I got, that's the one. Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm dying for that car. <laughs> just got this from gt slots the other day and i shot it for the their facebook page it's uh it's a capri of course it's not a mustang technically yeah i'm terrible but, with uh it's a beautiful car i posted the pictures on home racing world yeah so so that's me you know i buy things that i like because of the car that it represents it's just not a historically racing car it's just a pop culture car and i buy cars that are blue and yellow because i love blue and yellow that's me anybody else I'm a golf livery guy. I don't understand it. I've always loved that baby blue and orange for some strange reason. Like I said, for me, I've been, uh, you know, had a strong penchant towards digital lately. And, you know, I mean, it sounds so cliche, but I'm, I'm kind of a scale electrics guy. You know, I've got a, a, you know, racer sideways and I've got, you know, uh, a lot of fly cars and, different brands of cars, but the DPR door on the Scale Electrics car really does it for me. I mean that, you know, I, I've got one car here with the, the latest generation um, of the slotted chip in it, which is great because it'll run Carrera Digital. I don't, in, in, I don't know anyone with a Carrera Digital track close by, but I could run it and it'll run analog, you know, um, and I can run scale electric. So, you know, it'll, it'll run various uh, things and, you know, got to switch on it so I can switch it all the way out. So the chip's not there. I mean, it's done right. And it's a slotted car. Uh, but uh, that's because there's some guys over in Illinois that I haven't met yet. And that's what they run on their digital track. So I'm, I'm preparing myself to go 180 miles to this track in Illinois to run with these guys. And I wanted to have a, a car of my own to race instead of getting a loaner. But I got to say, generally speaking, if, if Scale Electric's got it, that's kind of, you know, if you're a smoker, you have your, your brand of cigarette, right? If you're a drinker, you have your brand of whiskey or scotch or whatever. And my brand of scotch is Scale Electric. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, that being said, if, any car that looks too cool could just end up getting bought and you know it won't be a shelf queen because the intent is to leave it on the shelf but because i'm doing so much digital racing lately you know probably probably only a hundred of my 300 cars are dpr door or uh digital chipped cars uh the all the rest of them are brands that don't have that dpr door and you know from time to time you look at your wall and you go maybe I should sell like a hundred cars, right? And then go buy a hundred other cars 
but they don't make a hundred other cars with DPR doors. So I ain't selling my cars. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of what it is for me. Oh, by the way, so a day when you held up your, your uh, DeLorean, I went and grabbed mine because take notice, I've removed some of the Hollywood, you know, the, in the rear end, there's a bunch of back to the future stuff that goes in here. I pulled all that stuff out and uh, a friend of mine just hates the DeLorean. He, he didn't like it as the one-to-one -one car. He's always talking about how ugly it is. I know he's going to watch this video later, so I'm saying this out loud, but he just thinks this thing is just butt ugly. And I always thought it was kind of a neat car. It wasn't the best looking car, but it was neat. So I started stripping this down, got it down to 74 grams, and it went from like a 10 second lap to a 601. And I have really not opened the car up to do anything yet. On my track, you know, a 601 is not the fastest. I mean, I've got some mid five cars, uh, like the Scalectrics uh, 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 BMW Z4. Now I've got a Magnet Marshall in the club around here races those GT uh, three cars with 200 grams of Magnet downforce. That's a huge amount of Magnet downforce. But that's what they do, right? And when in Rome, so and I'm like this: Scale Electrics, you know, all these a lot of slot car companies make slot cars with magnets in them, and they make tracks that those cars run on, and that's what consumers buy. So a lot of times, I'm looking for a great out of, and this is a, something that that I do when I look at slot cars. I always try to imagine what the out of box experience is going to be. I think that's where a lot of slot car companies kind of make a mistake. They don't think about their out of box experience for the normal everyday average consumer, which is none of us guys on this call, right? And so they, they come up with these cars and they're really great, but you got to do all kinds of stuff to make them equal to other cars that that same company sells, right? And you got to do all this stuff. And for your average consumer is going to buy a slot car track, put it on their carpet, have the kids run around a little bit, someone in the family that's older might get interested, turn it into a hobby instead of just a, a fun thing. You want that great out of box experience. And, and so I look for that all the time. So usually I don't adjust the magnets on my personal cars, but for the club, they run 200 grams. So I made my car 200 grams. And at 200 grams, that BMW Z4 will do like a 5.4 second lap, lap on a 100 foot linear length lap of my track. This thing is down to a 601 and I have not raised the magnet from the 164 grams that it's at. It's at 601 already. When I add another 25% more magnet downforce, I can't wait for Tim Miller, who I hope you see this video. I cannot wait to race your BMW Z4 against this DeLorean, who's probably going to clean your clock. There you go. But the DeLorean with all that Hollywood stuff on it only goes 88 miles an hour. Yep, yep. I tell you, that's why I had to take it off. <laughs> that's what I'm going to tell him. I need more than 88 scale miles per hour, Tim. So I took the Hollywood off, and I'm ready to go now. I like hearing that the club that you're going to go race with or, or the, the club that you're racing with has a limit, and they use a tool to make sure that everybody is abiding by that limit. Everything gets teched in, right? 200 is a lot. And, and, you know, like, I know that, you know, once you get a slot car, no matter who you are, at some point, you want to know, can it go better, right? So you're going you're gonna to mess with it. That, that goes without saying. But I do really appreciate when I run into a club and I find that people say, you know what, pretty much this is box stock. You know, we take it out, we put some silicone tires on it or some urethanes or whatever, and, uh, you know, we have a limit to how much you can do to it because it keeps the cost down for entry level people. Uh, it keeps the skill set down for the entry level people. So in some classes, they may at least be competitive, even if they're not going to win. And they know that as they progress, you know, in their driving skills, which is the first thing that I think you want to get. Uh, they also know that there might be hope that they could get to a podium, you know. Because, you know, when you're trying to learn to drive as a newbie, then Mary's a classic example of that. You know, she, <laughs> she might as have had, you know, 10 thumbs when it came to her, her first 
few forays on the slot car track. So we gave her a 250 gram car. And then systematically, I started reducing the magnet without telling her. So week after week, she'd come over <laughs> and her lap times were getting longer and longer. But she was also learning to drive. And now she's a pretty good driver. And, and you know, I can take a car and, and she picks them out. And then we order that car or she orders it. And then we do a little bit, you know. So you want to have that tuning capability. You want to have that, you know. And Kelly, I'm kind of sort of thinking of you when I'm talking that you do some of this tuning and stuff and you get all these different brands of cars because every different brand car that you get has a little different nuance to how you tune it. So, you know, get lots of different makes of cars, but as you're tuning, once you tune one car from a certain brand, kind of apply those same things to a couple more of their models before you move on to another brand. I, I think that that's another important thing, but I'm preaching the choir. You guys know all kinds of stuff already. I could learn from you. I mean, I would say take it, take it at your own speed. You know, there's, there's some guys that just go, they just jump in feet first and they're just like, Oh man, let's put the spring suspension on this pod. Let's get, let's, let's get some tungsten weight in the, in the magnet pocket. Let's, let's, you know, put some tape on the pod and can, you know, all this stuff. They just like first day, that's what they want to know. And then there's, then there's the other side, like new tires. That's it. You know, I was, uh, when you're talking about magnets, uh, Phil, I'm just curious, what kinds of things do you guys do to adjust the magnet uh, attraction? Do you put little tiny tuner magnets on the top or do you like try to raise and lower it or? Yeah. You know, I mean, when you're talking about scale electrics, there's not a lot you can do. So what we do is like, uh, you know, we run uh, uh, either quick slicks or super tires, you know, uh, max tracks, stuff like that. But like, you know, recently it's been a, a big run for everybody to go get super tires. So usually they have two or three different, uh, you know, uh, sidewall profiles, the outer diameter of the tire. And so what we do, what I start with is how low a tire can I get and still be within the limits of the club uh, magnet limits, right? And this club, by the way, has 34 different racing classes. They're all based on historical racing. So now there's eight what are called premier classes. So if you bought these eight cars, you'd know that every occasion that there's a race, you could race in one of the two races to be held that night with your own car. And then there's always loaners. You know, those of us who have, you know, 100, 200, 300 cars typically have duplicates in any particular racing class. So we share those, you know, and people, people borrow those cars but there's 34 different classes of cars and there's about six different magnet levels from all the way down at hundred grams of magnet downforce using the, using the magnet marshal and everybody checks in on the same magnet marshal. So uh, that's a deal. And then you can go up to 200 grams of magnet. That's the ceiling in the, in the club at the Gilmore car museum. Right. So, and th by the way, there's the, Southwest Michigan Scale Slot Racers uh, Association, which is really easy to remember. It's on Facebook. You can't miss it, right? So <laughs> I'll throw that in, in uh, Greg's stream for this, uh, for this Zoom chat in case you want to just see that Facebook page. It'll be easier to find it that way. But anyhow, um, uh, 200 is the maximum, and it's really about tire profile. Some people use little kicker magnets, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, you have to take a soldering iron and heat, superheat your magnet to reduce the magnet downforce. Of course, when it cools down, most of that comes back. So sometimes you're cycling through that. You, you can't do that on race night and get it right, you know. But, uh, you know, the, the technique is typically kicker magnets because you're usually going up uh, and tire profile. And sometimes it's higher tire profile because your magnet's too much, right? So. That's, that's the easiest technique. And then, of course, you can always order new bar magnets. You yeah. know, just swap them out until you find one that's near enough where you want it to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I forgot about the whole tire profile thing. You know, the, cl the closer the magnet is to the rail, the stronger it is. It's like, yeah. Uh, and it doesn't take much. You know, a millimeter is like a huge yeah. amount of, I mean, one, it's, you know, a millimeter is 32 millimeters in real life, <laughs> right? So, 
So at one to one, which is a which is a lot of distance. So you know you can raise and lower a car a millimeter and, and get a huge difference in magnet downforce. Yeah, I remember one of the early classes that I raced with the with the club in my area was a magnet class. We eventually moved to pretty much all no magnet, but at this time we were doing a magnet car. It was a fly group five cars, okay. and uh, I forget what the limit was. It was like a hundred grams or something like that, and mine was like just just over you know it was like 105 or something you know ridiculous but that was the hard line you had to be under that line yeah. so i tried the heat up thing you know and and like you said it pretty much comes most of the way back once it cools down yeah. uh, the solution for me ended up being a single layer of scotch tape on yeah. the magnet and then that was just enough to lift it just enough to reduce it to 100 or yeah, I think it was like 98, 99 grams or something like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's that's one of the reasons I, I'm not a big fan of magnet racing because it is such a pain in the butt to, to tune them all, to get yeah. them all even. A lot of magnet clubs just don't. They just say, whatever well, you know, it is, that's what we'll race it. <laughs> you know, that's, and that is one of my things too. You know, uh, John Lacko, who is the, the guy who actually owned the equipment that became – um what is now known as red barn raceway over at gilmore car museum but he actually owned the track previously and it was in another location that got moved to gilmore about two years ago and uh you know he's kind of like me hey anything anytime you get to a slot car track mag no mag wood track plastic track doesn't really matter analog digital i'm good either i'm i'm all over the map and uh we drove over to illinois and race with some guys over there in their 24 hour race. And it was all Nomag, you know. And my favorite cars when I was a kid were Aurora Model Motoring. You know, that was pre Magna Traction. You know, that was those, those cars, you know, they drifted through the corners, they do all the stuff. You know, when I got rid of a lot of my HO stuff, I kept all of my model motoring cars because I love the way they drive around the track and the way. You have to control the slide and, and stuff like that. So no mag is actually attractive to me. And, you know, if you don't mess with most of the slot cars that come out of the box, Carrera's got pretty pretty strong magnet downforce right out of the box. You know, I mean, you put them on a magnet marshal and they're like 300 grams, but the cars weigh, you know, 100, 100 grams. So mathematically, they're not real far off, but they're, they're a little further off from scale electric. But if you, most of the scale electric cars that come out, you know, they're a, 120, 130. It's unusual to see a car like this DeLorean that has 164 grams of magnet downforce on my personal magnet, Marshall. And so it, you can really get the back end sliding around and stuff. And I'm an advocate for that. You know, I'm like, we should just take them out of the box and say, hey guys, you can take it out of the box and you can change a guide blade to a slotted guide blade if you want. You can change your braids if you want and uh, you can blueprint it, but don't change the motor, don't change the magnets and let's go racing. You can put silicons on it, any size you want, but you don't add magnet, you don't have to reduce magnet. And I would love to see that in a club because then you're learning driving the crashes are less spectacular because, <laughs> you know, when you have 200 grams of magna, man, you go around a corner. When it comes off the track, it comes off the track. I mean, it's going. But uh, I love that drifting. I, you know, I love it a lot. My, my ex-brother-in-law just posted, uh, you know, he had done all this stuff, ordered a magnet marshal, and his boys are about, from about age 11, there's, is twins and then there's a nine-year-old and they all race go-karts right they're you know you know regular size child size go-karts but they also love to race skateboards motor they race dirt bikes i mean these kids are racers and they started racing and wanted to know what would happen if there was no magnet in the car and they ran it and he had the magnet marshal like three days he has not used it since because they pulled all the magnets out of the car and they're running on scale electrics plastic track no mag and they're running slotted so now his table is is uh 
nine feet wide and 20, you know, 30 feet long. So it's a pretty good size lap. The lap length's probably about 130, about 130 feet. And it's two lane. And, uh, you know, he's got, I don't know, a half dozen or so lane changers in it. But can you imagine a slot it, even a, you know, 22,000 RPM slot it, burning up down the, the straightaway, looking for brakes to get into that corner with no magnet on a plastic scale electrics track. That's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty wild racing. It's pretty cool. And, and that's pretty much the way that my digital club races is, is pretty much never any magnet at all. So yeah. zero grams of magnet downforce. Right. Yeah. And then with uh, slotted cars, we've been racing the slotted group C cars uh, on Skelectric Digital, Skelectric Sport track. Um, we usually change the tires to something like um, N18 or N22 tires that have pretty good mechanical grip with the track. And so... You know, one of the guys, I don't think we have any tracks quite that big. We did at one time have a nice long track, but most of them are, you know, eight by 16, you know, as you know, that's the biggest track would be like an eight by 16 track yeah. in the club, but it's still pretty good, you know, that's lap track. length, right? Yeah. I mean, you're still talking about, you know, the, you know, a hundred plus feet, you know, per lap. Yeah. Um, and yeah, those cars move and, and it's a, it's a different way to drive, you know, a hundred grams. You know, you can get the tail out with 100 grams, but it's it drives completely different than no magnet, than, com yeah. than complete lack of magnet. You know, yeah. you got to get down to like 30 or 40 before you're driving anything like a non-magnet car drives. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we are strictly non-magnet in our group. Okay. Yeah, a lot, pretty much I found that a lot of groups will start magnet and then they'll move towards no magnet. Uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously there's, there's a lot, there's still a lot of groups out there with plastic track and, and running magnets. It's, like you said, it's easy. You take the car out of the box, you slap it on the track, you pull the trigger. Pull the trigger and go. Yeah. The group I race with, the group I race with, we don't race, uh, we race on wood track, no magnets. Yeah. You know, uh, we may change tires on, uh, on the cars. And uh, we have a lot of builders classes, but it's all, uh, it's, there's no magnets whatsoever. So and, and the, the wood tracks are, they don't have a magna braid. Yeah. When you mentioned that, I, I realized that a lot of clubs start out with plastic track, you know, Ninco Carreras, Collectric or whatever. Yeah. And then, the, and then somebody builds a wood track and it's like, okay, well, we're going to race on his track and there's no magnets. And, and then guys are like, oh, this is a lot of fun. And then they go and race on the plastic track with that same car. And they're like, this drives completely different. I liked it better on the wood track. And then, you need, you know, you end up start going no magnets. You have more wood tracks that magnets don't work on. And then it's like, what's the point of having a magnet, uh, you know, series of races when you're going track to track? It's going to com perform completely differently on this track. Not even talking about tires, but just, yeah. you know, <laughs> the magnetic traction being not existent on one track. And then, you know, one or 200 grams if you're, you know, letting them go that high on the next track. And then it's like, well, what the heck, let's just go no mag entirely. That's probably a lot to do with it. Every time a wood track pops up, a, a club goes no mag. <laughs> yeah. well, a couple of our tracks do have magna braid, but there are also a couple which use copper tape, where of course, you know, uh, it's, a, uh, uh, it's a moot point. Uh, in point of fact, your, your, uh, your progress is correct. All of our tracks, including mine, I had started out as scale electric or in one, one case an Inco or a Carrera track. Uh, and after the first couple of wooden tracks were built and everybody saw how nicely the cars ran and you didn't, weren't forever running over those bumps and joints between the tracks and so on and so forth, there was a great spate of wooden track building. And, and, and that kind of brings me to, you know, you mentioned Magna Braid, uh, you know, even though it has enough material in there to, to create a magnetic pull with a car with a magnet that's still not as strong as, you know, the steel rails on a Skelectric or an Inco that are proud or, or whatever. So it's still different, you know, even though it's Magna Braid, which leads me back to, you know, you were mentioning, uh, Phil, you were mentioning how Carrera cars have such strong magnetic pull. That's because their rails are stainless steel, which have less, you know, attractive force yeah. from, so they have to put more magnets in to get a similar yeah. performance as Skelectric cars do on Skelectric track. Yeah. Put a Skelectric car on a Carrera track, it's, it feels like it's got no traction at all. 
yep. and you put a Carrera car on a Scalextric track and it's, and it's like a limpet mine. It's just stuck. So yeah, <laughs> another yeah. reason to go Nomad, just like, just let's forget about trying to make them even with magnets and just pull the magnets out. <laughs> well, like I said, you know, the, the, the magnet thing, sometimes in my club, you know, I show up, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I, you know, I don't know how Ron does it with 900 cars, you know, but with 34 classes of cars in the, the club that I'm in, there are times when I don't have time to tune to really mess with magnet stuff, you know, and, and so I'll show up at the track and in my car, you know, will be over the hard line, you know, magnet that day is 150 grams and I'm at 154, you know, and, uh, you know, if you, if you take the buy on that, then you're going to get crucified if you do well, because the rest of the guys are going to be like, you were four grams over. So I don't like to race if my car isn't at spec. And sometimes I just withdraw from the race and they say, well, why are you withdrawing? I said, because, you know, we got 34 classes of cars and we run magnet and the amount of time it takes to tune 34 classes of cars your primary car and your backup car. <laughs> well, I need to tune 68 cars over the course of a year, not knowing necessarily what class is going to be the one that gets run, you know. And if not, you know, I might be able to reduce that tuning down to 30 cars that I have to finely tune to get them ready to, to race, you know, to, to be able to race every month. And, and so, you know, I think, uh, when I went to go race Nomag, I went, wow, this is really fantastic. You know, I've been slowly trying to introduce reduced magnet at my home track with the people that come to my house to race, which are not almost none of the club members come here to race. Um, and they're welcome to, they just, they have their race night and then they're off to the rest of their lives. But for me, um, you know, I leave it, come out of the box, put the thing on the track with some silicon tires on it. That gives you some traction on scale electrics track. Run what you brung. You know, it's it's fun. I've got, you know, I own RCS 64, PC Lab Counter, Ultimate Racer 3.0. I've got the TrackMate software. Um, I've got I've got like five of the Windows based um race management systems that are fully licensed and i have a couple of uh i have three 7042 power bases which are not in use right now and then of course i got a bunch of arc pros because they come in every set plus i bought three arc pro expansion sets right so pretty nice <coughs> and and i've been running arc pro with the magic app but you know i, I really try to uh, kind of do a run with your brung. And then what we do is we class the cars based on their lap time. So you could have a group C and a GT3 and a Trans Am car on the track at the same time. But if someone goes, let's run, I want to run this car and it's a 7.2 second lap car. Everyone's got to have a car that's about there. And what we do is we give one racer the car and then they run the car hard and see where they get to in a lap time and they run everybody's car and then we go race. You know, that way we, we think we've got similar driving skills, et cetera. But, you know, you can never make that perfect when you're running magnet. You know, there's no way to, there's no way to have perfect balance with magnet amongst the cars. You know, there's just nothing. I mean, you don't have perfect balance with no mag because tuning matters so much, right? But at least you know the equation of, one person have a more magnet than another goes away at that point. And the headache of tuning magnets goes away at that point. So it's just what it is. Yep. It is. And it is also pushing two and a half hours. I think we should probably wrap it up. Does anybody yeah. have any last minute quick questions for the, for the group? All right. Well, save us for next time. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to everybody. It's good to see faces and names and stuff like that. That's uh, very cool. I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Greg, thanks for putting this together. I've watched all the other four and you know, you know me, you know, I think I've, I've poked the bear on two or three people on various things that I want to see invented, right. That, that don't, don't exist yet. 
Um, but uh, this is really cool. You know, I, I think it's great that you, you, you employed a technology the world ran to to say hi to grandma and you, you up the game for all of us in our hobby by, by putting this together in a, yet another forum that happens to be this for this format. That's pretty cool. Somebody, somebody would have done it. Somebody would have, but you did it, right? I'm so just glad that I can't thank somebody else. You did it. Okay, so you're welcome. <laughs> well, yeah, can I thank say, you. except you're welcome. So, uh, yes, thank you for thank everybody you. coming, and we will see people next week. All right, Bye. thanks, guys. See you later.